Like everyone here, I was hanging on every word because building coalitions between unions and the community has been a major part of what we do, uh, and it, we don't necessarily understand it as well as we should, even though we do this work. So I was literally hanging on every word that you were saying, and and when you talked about the uh, how unions have this tendency to use coalitions instrumentally you really hit home. That's exactly uh, what distinguishes the Ontario Health Coalition. And by way of introduction of our next speaker, who's the coordinator for the Ontario Health Coalition, I'd like to say that's a, one of the things that makes the OHC so different, um, is that it actually has the power, it has the mass base, it has the integrity, um, it has the credibility to actually stand up to us, you know, to the CAW, to other unions, to the labor movement as a whole and say, but oh, wait a minute, you know, we don't, we, we're in coalition with you, but we, we're not just an instrument, but, you know, we're not just your instrument. Uh, that, the other thing that I, I would say by way of introduction to Natalie is that uh, this is a, a, a coalition that she's speaking for is one of the few really truly mass-based coalitions, but they have 50 local coalitions that are active in Ontario. They've had a tenfold increase in membership. They've done the most comprehensive research on private clinics. And uh, they have a demonstrated capacity to mobilize. But I'd also like to say that, that uh, what stands out uh, with the OHC is that they, they actually have both an inside and an outside strategy. We see some coalitions that will remain nameless, we're not here to criticize people, uh, you know, who have only an outside strategy that can only mobilize in the streets, that can't actually talk to politicians or influence anybody in the bureaucracy. And then you have coalitions that do only inside work, that only talk to the bureaucracy and the politicians that have no capacity to put people in the streets. What's different about the OHC is that it can do both. And, uh, and I've seen both up front and personal because I, one of the most vivid memories that I have with about the Ontario Coalition is actually occupying the, the, build, the Ministry of Health with Natalie and her crew with the CAW flying squads out on the street to lend support uh, while we were inside trying to negotiate a deal. We'd actually get access to the uh, secret documents uh, behind the P3 in Brampton. But uh, one last thing I'll say before I turn this mic over to Natalie is that when I was asked to speak without any prompting from Natalie or anybody about uh, political strategies to a political education class at McMaster University sponsored in part by my union. I actually talked about the OHC as an example. Uh, so I have that in common with Amanda. The, I said that if it wasn't for a big, powerful and principled coalition like the OHC, what would be the tendency of a union in the healthcare sector? We're a business organization. We like to talk about being a social movement and a social union. We all talk about that in the union movement. But the reality is we're business organizations too. We obviously have to bargain collective agreements and get things done for the members. The tendency would be to say it doesn't really matter where the money comes from or who it's being given to, whether it be a private or a public sector employer. Because we just want our employer to have more money so that we can get more money for the members. Wouldn't that actually be the tendency of a union to think that way if it was left to its own devices? But it's because you're allied with this powerful coalition that you have the leaders of the, the local and national leaders of the CAW and other unions actually on film saying, we support this campaign against privatization. In other words, if it wasn't for a community coalition, you wouldn't be disciplining us. So you're far from, far from just being an instrument of us. You're actually, in some ways, leading us. 
and that's what a real coalition would do. That wasn't so much about Natalie, like in a personal sense, but it's about the work that she does, and I think that's more important. So let's hear it. A uh, warm welcome for Natalie Mara. Well, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, Amanda asked me if I would, um, if I would uh, just say a few words about uh, what coalition organizing is like and what what it means. And and I wanted to add in, I think, about some of the challenges that that I hope that we collectively can think about um, as we look at the work that we're doing and the context in which we're working. I, um, I really loved this book. I thought it was great, Amanda, and congratulations for it. just an enormous amount of work, enormous amount of traveling, and a huge commitment. Um, I really think it's a, like, a very mature and thoughtful, um, real-life analysis of how coalitions work, um, of, of what the capacities are, and where the challenges lie. And I think that the lessons that Amanda has drawn out about what makes str for strong coalitions, what, what might actually provide us with a way that we can create the space to make social change in our societies, in, in neoliberal societies, I think is very, um, very important. And Amanda uh, talks about others a lot um, in this book, but, but she herself is a living example, I think, of a, of a true committed activists traveling around the world um, and trying to um, build the capacity of organizations to make uh, social change. So thank you so much for that. I share Amanda's uh, vision um, of the importance of union um, and community coalitions. I think it's vital actually that these, uh, that these specific um, types of coalitions exist and that we, particularly in the current context, uh, use the power that we have individually um, and collectively to fight against the movements in Canada uh, away from supporting coalitions uh, within, uh, within the unions. Um, and I don't mean the OHC. The OHC is very well supported by, uh, by many unions. But I, but I mean in general, if you look at Canada now, um, it, in, in terms of national citizens coalitions, national coalitions around poverty, most of them are gone. Around women's rights, most of them are, are gone. Around just about every equity issue, most of them are gone. There are coalitions being built around pensions um, for obvious reasons. There are some seniors coalitions still in existence. There is the Council of Canadians. But honestly, if you look across the country, um, the, the movements against global um, neoliberalism, against um, uh, around equity issues, have almost all of them disappeared. Um, and many of these broad-based citizens movements, they don't actually generate political space, they don't make a lot of social change, they don't make a context in which we can win social change. Even in Ontario, I've spent now 10 years consistently on the road, and in most towns, we are the only progressive group organizing at all. There might be a daycare coalition. In some cases, there's a labor council, and there's a move to uh, reduce the number of local labor councils and centralize them into, into uh, reduced numbers. Um, there may be uh, a Council of Canadians chapter. Um, but in general, there are not progressive organizations on the ground in most communities now across Ontario. Um, and we, you know, the Ontario Health Coalition has about 50 active local health coalitions, about 70 if, if you count the ones that are less active, but there are hundreds and hundreds of communities across Ontario and the potential to build much more massively is there, but we, we don't, you know, we're not doing it. And it's not part of the culture of our social movements in Ontario or in Canada to actually go out and organize en masse, what, uh, what uh, Amanda is calling multi-scaled um, coalitions. I think one of the crucial things that we have to change if we're going to win progressive social change is that we need to reinstill both in ourselves and in our movements a culture of mass organizing. Um, and for me, um, that has meant devising ever new ways to um, get people to actually talk to other people to organize them into a mass movement for social change. Um, and so a lot of those, the tools that Amanda talks about in her book, uh, the campaigns that we've used that are really mass organizing campaigns, door-to-door -door campaign for the Romano uh, Commission, 
um, on the future of healthcare in Canada. Uh, pl plebiscite campaigns or referendums, local citizen called referendums uh, to try and stop the P3 hospitals are really about providing a tool for and, and, a, and a structure for local activists to use to go out and talk to people and organize their resistance to, um, to the privatization of healthcare. Um, why coalitions? Labor in, uh, in Canada is still probably strong enough to do many things on its own. It could probably achieve some limited pension reform, well, I guess it has uh, actually just recently achieved some limited pension reform pretty much uh, on its own and also because of just a crisis in, uh, in, uh, in capitalism <laughs> around pensions. Um, uh, but I believe, especially in public services, that it, it is also uh, just right to work um, between unions and communities in consensus on these issues. The public services that we're talking about serve um, themselves serve a, a, a political and a social uh, and economic function, um, and uh, and so it's not just uh, like a, you know a private sector workplace in which you're talking about exact extracting you know certain levels of wages and working conditions from an employer. The employer uh, serves a public interest function. In, if you think about Medicare in Canada, we're talking about a transfer of more than a hundred billion dollars every year in public funds. It's the biggest social transfer in the country, and without it, um, you can imagine um, the scale of, of income inequality that we would uh, that we would be looking at. Um, and it's also, as a healthcare system, something that um, is about very complex human interrelationships, very complex human needs. Um, well, the healthcare system may be a workplace for hundreds of thousands of Canadians. It's also the place where every one of us is born and the place where almost all of us are going to die. It's, it's, um, it's intrinsic to our lives. And I think that given um, that context, it's only right um, that coalitions around the future of healthcare neither um, represent workers to the expense of patients, nor do they represent patients to the expense of workers. Um, I'm going to skip over this because some of it is long and you've been here for a while. I wanted to um, just highlight a few things that I, that I thought you might want to hear about. One is um, Amanda's example of multi-scaled coalitions. Amanda's focus on the importance of multi-scaled co coalitions, i.e. coalitions that have uh, capacity at, at a variety of levels, local, central. The context in which we work is one in which if we don't fight to preserve Medicare, it's going to be privatized. The private clinics in this country have already brought in two-tier, and much of what we lose in healthcare, we lose because there is no public debate. It just happens through stealth. Um, so a three-week campaign of um, media events or, or public rallies or various mobilizing events targeted on different communities within that town uh, uh, leading into the voting day at which we asked the shoppers drug marts, the churches, the local Max Milks, etc. to host tables outside their stores in which people could come and vote in a plebiscite whether they supported uh, the privatization of their local hospital through P3 or whether they wanted to keep their hospital public. And in that way, in five towns, we were able to get more than 80,000 people to vote against privatizing their local hospitals. And through doing that, we were able to do what I don't think any other jurisdiction has accomplished. This is a huge multinational industry, by the way. It's the, it's the financial industry, it's the lawyers and the consultants, all very tied into um, both conservative and liberal parties. It's the construction industry. Um, and then on top of that, there's the multinational service pri privatizers, et cetera, et cetera. All uh, with these deals that are incredibly complex and yield incredibly high rates of return. So big, big force pushing for them. Um, and what we were able to accomplish was a significant rollback in the privatization of uh, both the scope and the size and the number of these uh, P3 deals, something that wasn't accomplished anywhere else. In fact, <coughs> it's my experience now um, that we don't actually have to start off by lobbying. We start off by huge mass campaigns. For example, mass town hall meetings to save rural hospitals from being closed. And ultimately, the government will come to us and ask us what it's going to take to shut up. And, and uh, I think that that is really uh, the type of where we've gotten to in terms of being able to build the strength of large uh, 
based social movement in Ontario. As we look forward, I think that there are some um, important challenges, and, and I'm glad that you pointed these out, Amanda. One, we have the same thought. <laughs> One is that it's very difficult in a, in, a, in a coalition that's a union community coalition to build consensus uh, around um, ideas for reform, around proactive ideas for reform. It's much easier to build consensus around uh, opposing something. And it's, it's been very difficult. In a, so in a recent example, um, you know, all of the community groups in the coalition uh, want us to talk about the outrageous executive salaries, all of the administration that's, bur you know, mushrooming in the healthcare system. But um, the union groups don't want us to talk about wage levels at all. They're afraid that if we talk about executive salaries, that they'll be looking at a price freeze for uh, unionized labor. Um, and it's and it's virtually impossible for us then to talk about administrative costs that are part of market-based reforms, about all of that stuff, and very difficult to just to, to get the public to support increasing funding for hospitals, for example, when they see in their local hospital that the CEO, you know, in Strathroy, tiny town makes three hundred and eighty thousand dollars, ridiculous, right? And uh, and that they have ever more managers and ever fewer frontline staff. Uh, in that hospital. So um, so building consensus around proactive ideas for reform, very difficult. We've managed to do it in long-term care to some extent. We've managed to do it in home care, um, but uh, much harder in some ways in the hospital system. Um, and and so we have, one of our weaknesses is that we've been sort of swept aside. The, the other side is very good at looking at where capacity needs to be built and um, in jumping forward with ideas like P3s uh, to fill the, to, to address um, current challenges of government and uh, in their own interests. Um, I think it's a challenge to, to balance growing a coalition into a huge organization um, and maintaining a depth of political analysis, uh, maintaining a class analysis, maintaining a left-wing political analysis. For example, we've spent the last two years now fighting hospital closures, and we've stopped almost all of them. But uh, many of the groups that are part of the coalition in the rural towns, um, massive, massive farm town coalitions, absolutely, you know, we'll have a town hall meeting and 1,800 people will come out. By far, you know, the mo almost the entire town will be there. But, um, but many of these people need to be taught about why public versus private health care. They understand health care is their local hospital. They don't really want that privatized. But, the, but generalizing it across the healthcare system and understanding um, sort of a deepening sense of politics is important. Um, the other balance that we need to figure out how to achieve is how to build the current campaign um, and how to, how to balance the necessity for urgent campaigns all the time. The latest privatization threat comes up. But in addition, we need to not just go with the ideas of the small group of people who come up with str strategic ideas, but deepen the number of people who have broad-based organizing ideas, who have the ability to create strategy around those things. Um, and so, I th I think one of the ch one of the um, most rewarding parts of organizing coalitions is that it's ever changing. That as you reach a certain stage, there's something else to do. It's always challenging. Um, and the political context is always difficult, so there's always lots to do these days. Um, but that, that's, I think, what we need to, uh, to look at in the future. Um, I guess uh, the last thing is that in a context of, of neoliberalism, in a context of global, globalization, um, we have not, any of us, addressed um, where we can work globally to counter some of the massive global um, coalitions from the other side, the, you know, the WTO and all of the um, uh, the loss of health care as a, as a, as a single-tier service or even as a public service in so many countries around the world um, that is so vital. And as health care in Canada becomes increasingly privatized, um, I believe that it will become more important than ever that we figure out some ways to create meaningful um, multinational coalitions to address um, address the trends of the of you know the people who are, sadly are becoming the owners and controllers of our healthcare institutions and uh, 
and um, services. Um, in Canada, Medicare is very seriously under threat. Most people don't realize the extent, and that's, I suppose, my fault, <laughs> that most people don't realize the extent to which it's under threat. Um, across the country, we now have more than, um, more than 70 private um, hospitals and MRI clinics operating. We found 89 uh, um, entities that are violating the Canada Health Act in uh, five provinces in our most recent study. Um, in British Columbia and Quebec, there is open two-tier health care. Almost all of the private clinics sell two-tier health care, even though it's against the law. Um, and uh, and as, um, as the ownership and control over health institutions is turned over from not-for-profit not and public entities to private for-profit entities, stopping two-tier health care, stopping private insurance, and stopping um, the destruction, ultimately, of, of our public health care system, I, I think will prove very, very, very difficult. Um, uh, one note that I cannot leave without telling you about is that in British Columbia there's a core challenge now. It's a charter challenge that has been brought by uh, the private clinics. Um, five patients, um, supported by the BCNU, the, the nurses union in BC, um, brought a case against the BC government for not enforcing its Medicare Prote Protection Act and the Canada Health Act, the principles of single-tier Medicare in that province. Um, and uh, in response, the BC government finally acted just before the last provincial election and tried to audit Brian Day, uh, Brian Day's Canby Surgical um, Hospital, the largest private hospital in the country, and the False Creek, Creek uh, sorry, the False Creek Surgical Clinic, and the clinics refused them entry. Um, and so, in part, in, in an attempt to avoid the audits, because these private clinics both bill the public system and bill patients as well, they extra bill and they double dip. Um, the clinics have brought a charter challenge. Uh, against all of the parts of BC legislation that would protect single-tier Medicare. If the clinics win, even the BC Health Coalition fears that the BC government will not defend Medicare um, because it's ushered in privatization. It, um, it supports the private clinics and they're very deep within the government. Um, if the clinics win even at any level, even in the lower courts, it is very likely that they'll move forward with a very aggressive agenda. The, the kind of um, echo chamber um, public relations campaign that we saw after the Supreme Court Chiuli decision will be nothing compared to what they are set up to do if they win, even in the lower courts. They won't wait for an appeal by the BC government. It's by no means a given that the BC government would even appeal it to the Supreme Court. If they appeal it to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court will ultimately be making a decision about whether to uphold single-tier Medicare in Canada or whether to uh, bring it down. Um, so this uh, charter challenge is supremely important and that means that in the upcoming uh, year uh, campaigning on the private clinics, getting Canadians to understand that we're not talking about allowing people to take some pressure off the system, but we're talking about a greedy set of corporations who are selling two-tier access uh, to care for their own private benefits against the public interest, I think will become more uh, and more vital. And I know that there are some academics here. I just wanted to bring that to your attention also to the activists because we need to start getting out the word about that. I'm going to end now uh, by saying that I, um, I wanted to thank Amanda so much for her work and, um, and that I've learned a lot myself about democracy and about the importance of, of the public interest in a very deep, I think, way through doing this work. And I hope that you uh, who aren't already members will join us and I wanted to leave you with a saying from Bob White, which is, uh, sometimes it's not the strength of the argument that matters, it's the strength behind the argument, and that's us. Thanks.